Again, I would like to thank those of you that are tuning in, uh, those that have tuned in on uh, multiple occasions, have enjoyed uh, the messages. Uh, we are located in Wilton, New Hampshire, Good News Bible Church on 27 Hutchinson Road, and we meet at 10 a.m. on Sundays, and we would love to have you come visit. If you do not have a church home, uh, please come and visit us and be blessed. Thank you. Last week, we looked at the Apostle Paul's attitude concerning his house arrest back in Rome. And he witnessed the spread of the gospel, starting with the palace guard. And we also saw Paul's boldness had caused other believers to begin to preach the, the gospel of Jesus Christ with much courage. Uh, we also looked at how Paul knew that God was in the very details of his life. In Acts chapter 19, it says, After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome. I must visit Rome. And the King James Version says, After these things were ended, Paul purposed in his spirit when he had passed through Macedonia to go to Jerusalem. So, uh, it's most likely that because he was persuaded by the Holy Spirit, uh, he also, you know, that overrode or became part of the purpose in his own spirit is a better way to say that. So letter A on your outline, it is a blessing when the Lord burdens your heart and then com confirms his will. It, it's a blessing when, when the Lord burdens your heart, but then he confirms his will. He says, the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So the Holy Spirit's leading him. He purposed in his heart because of the move of the Holy Spirit. And now in the night's time, uh, the Lord shows up and tells him to take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must, you must also testify in Rome. So, so Paul's desire to go to Rome, the center of the civilization, so to speak, was a burden that the Lord placed within Paul's heart. And then the Lord personally confirmed to Paul that he would testify in Rome. So this leads us to, to letter B. God will often burden your heart long before he reveals the work. Long before he reveals the de details, he'll burden our heart. Remember this, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has prepared or has before ordained that we should walk in them. Long before we walk in the works and the purposes and the will of God, it's already been laid out. Because God is in eternity. He knows what we're going to do. He knows what's going to take place. We are just to trust him and walk through that will. Salvation, we know, is God's workmanship. The word workmanship, poem or poema, denotes a work of art or a masterpiece. It differ, differs from human works, but believers are God's workmanship because they've been created to do a work only God can do in the person of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit through us. In fact, the purpose of this creation is that believers will do the works that God has called them to do. There's a truth that Christians need to comprehend. In fact, it is extremely important to understand because it will guard our hearts from becoming legalistic and clouding the meaning of God's grace within our lives. Let her see right here. God's workmanship is not achieved by good works, but it is the result in good works. Let me say that again. God's workmanship is not achieved by good works, but it is to result in in good works. Therefore, we can't take any, any kind of pride in what we do. It's just the result of our relationship with him. In the clause which God prepared in advance for us to do, the word which refers back to the works in the previous clause. For us to do is literally in order that we might walk in them. So the purpose of these prepared in advance works is not to work in them, but to 
walk in them. In other words, God has prepared a path of good works for you, for me, which he will perform in and through those works as we walk in them by faith. This does not mean doing a work for God. Instead, it is God performing his work in and through us. Note this truth as Paul mentions it in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. He says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Therefore, the works that we do, the things that we say, the things we do for others should be a reflection of God using us, God working through us. To will means to desire or to have or experience, uh, to want or to wish or to be resolved or determined. To purpose, or the equivalent is to love, or to take delight, to have pleasure. To act is to be efficient, effectual, engaged in an activity or a function, with possible focus upon the energy or force involved. It's to be at work for God. It's to be at work for God because He is doing a work in us. For it is God who works in us to will and to act according to his good purpose. So now we come to a part of Paul's letter that has been interpreted in so many various ways. He says, For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. King James says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. Through your prayer, the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Interpretations vacillate from Paul's release from imprisonment to his vindication in court, to his deliverance from cowardice, uh, to his final salvation. And these interpretations all center on the word deliverance or salvation, which mean rescue or safety, salvation or saving. This shall turn to my salvation. That is, it will be the means of my temporal safety, of my deliverance. For so the word here is understood. But the Jews had denounced the apostle as an enemy to Caesar. But he knew that. When the nature of the gospel should be fully known, the Romans would see that he could be no enemy to Caesar, who proclaimed a prince whose kingdom was not of this world, who had taught in the most unequivocal manner that all Christians were to give tribute to whom tribute was due, and while they feared God to honor also the king, so why would that be an offense? Especially once senators and people in, in government positions and begin to get saved. And then he says, through your prayer, knowing them to be genuine followers of Christ, he, Paul satisfied that their prayers would be very available in his behalf. And under God, he places much dependence upon their prayers. So the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the word in the Greek which we translate supply, signifies also furnishing whatever is necessary. Furnishing whatever is necessary. Adam Clark says, The Spirit of God, he expected to help all his infirmities and to furnish him with all the wisdom, prudence, strength of reason, and argument, which might be necessary for him in the different trials he had to pass through with his persecutors and the civil powers at whose judgment seat he stood. Albert Barnes says, whether the effect shall be to turn public favor toward the Christian religion and secure my release, or whether it shall be to instigate my enemies more so as to lead to my death, I am satisfied that the result, so far as I am concerned, will be well. 
The word salvation here does not refer to his release from captivity, for he was not absolutely certain of that and could not expect that to be affected by the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. But the meaning is that all these dealings, including his imprisonment, and especially the conduct of those who thought to add affliction to his bonds, would be among the means of his salvation. Trying and painful as all this was, yet trial and pain, Paul reckoned among the means of grace. And he had no doubt that this would prove so. You see, as a man of convictions, Paul shared his assurance that his fetters would eventually result in his deliverance. The Greek word translated deliverance here was used in different ways throughout the New Testament. It often means spiritual deliverance or salvation, or being born again. But here, Paul uses the word to refer to either the final stage of his salvation or future vindication in a Roman court. It seems unlikely that he had his release in mind since in the next two sentences he wrote of the real possibility of his near death. Whether or not Paul would be released is not really the issue here. And whether or not we experience release from our personal trials and testings or difficult situations should not be our main concern. What Paul writes next should be for us the driving force in our lives. Hence the title of this message, What on Earth Are You Living For? What on earth are you living for? Number one, right here, the exaltation of Jesus in life or death helps us to possess sufficient courage while avoiding shame. The exaltation of Jesus in life or death helps us to possess sufficient courage while avoiding shame. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. What a, what a powerful verse that is that Paul says. And it goes right along with, you know, what on earth are, are, are you living for? Well, Paul is living for Christ. Boldness. Sufficient courage. Boldness. It means to be blunt, to, to be frank, to, to uh, by implication, it, it means confidence. In assurance. John McCain. In the past, he says, I've been able to overcome my fears because of an acute sense of an even greater fear, that of feeling remorse. You can live with pain. You can live with embarrassment. Remorse is an awful companion. And whatever the unwelcome consequences of courage, they are unlikely to be worse than the discovery that you are less than you pretend to be. Whatever the unwelcome consequences of courage, they are unlikely to be worse than the discovery that you are less than you pretend to be. Max Andrews says, courage is the internal strength, internal strength to live for Christ or die for Christ Whichever is required, only such courageous living exalts Christ. Courage is the internal strength to live for Christ or to die for Christ, whichever is required. Only such courageous living exalts Christ. 60-year-old Foster Walker accidentally strode onto the scene of a holdup at a store in Memphis, Tennessee. The gunman pointed a gun in his face and said, hand over your money or I'll shoot. Mr. Walker said, go right ahead and shoot. I just got through reading my Bible and I've already said my prayers. The robber just stood and stared at him speechless. He didn't shoot. Foster turned and walked out of the store untouched. Courage. Courage. Whichever is required. To live for Christ or to die for Christ, only such courageous living exalts Christ. Paul says, 
Therefore, to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Paul was not sure whether he would experience release or martyrdom for his faith. He was certain of one thing, though, that he wanted Christ to be exalted in his body either way. This was Paul's expectation and hope. The apostle knew full well it would take courage to face death with a proper attitude. Paul's concern was not what would happen to him, but what testimony would be left for his Lord. Release would allow him to continue preaching Christ, but martyrdom would also advance the cause of Christ. And he knew this. You see, letter A, what a person loves supremely is that for which they live and die. Let me say this again. What a person loves supremely is that for which they live and die. Christian life and death. These are two questions of any essential consequence to ask in regard to self. Question one, what is the, what is the ultimate object of life? And question two, what is the ultimate object beyond life? In other words, going back to the title of this message, what on earth are we living for? To me, Paul says, to live is Christ. True Christianity is a life of dependence upon Jesus. Number one on your outline, our dependence on Christ is to be constant. It's to be constant. Hebrews 5.14, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Constant use of the Bible. You want to live for Christ? Then know the teachings in the Bible. You want to exalt Christ? Then obey the teachings in the Bible. You want to leave a testimony? For Christ, then live, be constant in your living out the teachings of the Bible. Number two, our dependence on Christ should be accompanied with humility. Psalm 25, 9, he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. James 4, 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. And number three, our dependence on Christ is to be trustful. John 12, 36, put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, Jesus said. Psalm 62, trust in him at all times. O people, pour out your hearts to him for God is our refuge. Number four, our dependence on Christ is at times based on the unseen. Our dependence on Christ is at times based on the unseen. 2 Corinthians 4.18, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. He goes on in chapter 5, we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. That's why it goes back to this, our dependence on Christ is to be constant, constantly in his word, constantly living out his word and exalting him in the process. This brings us to number two. A life of communion and conformity with Christ is to be habitual and intentional as it embraces all of life. Let me remind you of the importance of courage, boldness, and the discipline it takes to live for Jesus. In almost every area of life, you and I are called upon to display the discipline of boldness Encourage Our testimony for Jesus is seen in our everyday lives, not just at a church. And there are times when adversity strikes and things do not go according to plan. There are times that you do not want to be ashamed of the gospel. 
or bring shame to the gospel. Furthermore, every Christian's goal in life should be for Christ to be exalted in our everyday life. And this means in our home life, our work life, our private life how we deal with relationships, how we honor our commitments and our vows and our promises. This all takes courage, determination, and to a very great extent, a dying to self. So getting back to boldness and courage, letter A, bravery comes along as a gradual accumulation of discipline. Let me say this again. Bravery comes along as a gradual accumulation of discipline, bravery, courage, commitment. It it all ties in with a gradual accumulation of discipline. This is a quote from astronaut Buzz Aldrin. On July 20th, 1969, Buzz Aldrin became the second human being to set foot on the moon. He served as the pilot of the Apollo 11 lunar module, the capsule that descended to the surface of the moon. Aldrin also flew into space during the Gemini program, a precursor to the Apollo program, and is one of the world's leading advocates of space exploration. He has more than 4,500 hours of flying time, including 290 hours of space flight and eight hours in space outside of a spacecraft. He earned a bachelor's degree with honors from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, New York in 1951. He entered the U.S. Air Force after graduating from West Point and earned his Air Force pilot wings in 52. He served as a combat jet pilot during the Korean War in 1950 to 53. And Aldrin temporarily left flying in 1959 to enter graduate studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He planned to complete a master's degree and then apply for test pilot school, but instead he became the first astronaut to earn a PhD degree in aeronautics, in astronautics in 1963, and he earned the nickname Dr. Rendezvous. Dr. Rendezvous. His thesis subject was the study of piloted rendezvous, bringing piloted spacecraft into close proximity with each other. Techniques he devised are used on all space rendezvous and docking flights. Gemini 12 flew from November 11th to November 15th in 1966. Aldrin's two-hour spacewalk on the flight was the longest and most successful spacewalk ever done to that time. His rendezvous rendezvous abilities were also put to use. He manually recomputed all the rendezvous maneuvers after the onboard radar failed. After Gemini 12, Aldrin was assigned to the backup crew of Apollo 8 with Neil Armstrong and Harrison Jack Schmidt. Aldrin was closely involved with Apollo 9 rendezvous flight flight tests and first flight in, in which two astronauts and a lunar module separated from the third astronaut in the command and service module. The lunar module of the Apollo spacecraft could not re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, so rendezvous and docking were operations that were critical to the life of the two astronauts in the lunar module. Apollo 11 launched on July 16, 1969, carrying Aldrin, Armstrong, and Collins, Mike Collins. On July 20th, 1969, Buzz Aldrin joined Neil Armstrong on the surface of the moon for a spacewalk that lasted two hours in 14 minutes. And why did I just share all this with you? Look at the sequence of events that happened in his life. It was a life of discipline, a life of goals and achieving those goals, a life of intentionality. You see, a Christian's walk with the Lord has to be disciplined as Buzz Aldrin was disciplined. And discipline takes commitment. It takes time. It takes practice. It takes application. And with all these disciplines, when it comes time to face death and to take part in the greatest rendezvous of all time, you will be ready and will not be ashamed. Why? Because bravery comes along as a gradual accumulation of discipline. Hence, 
that sanctification is the will of God, the ongoing process of being made holy. What on earth are you living for? This brings us to number three. The goal of Christians while on earth is to aid in the commencement, the cultivation, and culmination of faith in the lives of others. Not just themselves, but in the lives of others. The goal of Christians while on earth is to aid in the commencement, the cultivation, and the culmination of faith in the lives of others. But it is more necessary for you, Paul said, that I remain in the body, that I remain here on earth. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. There are times when I say, I just want to go home. I just want to be in my eternal home. I have heard other Christians say the same thing, especially when they're suffering. Possessing a mind that puts the needs of others above your own personal desires, as Paul concluded that if it was God's will he should remain, is to possess the mind of Christ. See, the easy thing is to just go home, to our eternal home. The harder thing is to be here. I mean, who doesn't want to be in the presence of God? Who doesn't want to experience perfection? And Paul said, it's necessary for you that I remain. And this brings us to letter A. Life and death are in God's sovereign timing, but a person can often live their life as if they have already died. I have seen many Christians clothe, close themselves off to living for the progression of others. They quit fellowship. They quit going to church. They limit their involvement. They become antisocial, recluses. They even stop investing in others' lives. They put up personal walls, and their, and their social relationships, if any, are superficial, stale, dry, or even non-existent. This is the easiest thing to do, especially if you have been hurt emotionally, physically, mentally, and socially. It is easy to just quit, to throw in the towel and run from the calling to love God and to love others. And you know what? We don't have that option. We do not have that option. As believers, you and I are called and commanded to love the Lord, to love the brother, and to love the lost, and to love our enemies. And if you spend your life trying to avoid these things, you have missed the calling of your life. What on earth are you living for? You see, let her be, it is unbiblical to say you love God while not loving others. It is unbiblical to say you love God while not loving others. It is unbiblical to say you love God while not loving others. A new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. What on earth are you living for? It is a selfless attitude a commend and commendable in the eyes of the Lord to love others as yourself. The easy thing is to gain Christ through death. The harder thing is to remain here and engage in others for their spiritual salvation and their progression. And yet Paul knew that it was not his decision, just as it's not ours. It is the will of God that will triumph in the end. So again, the question here, Paul lived his life for the spiritual progression of others. What on earth are you living for? 
It's a piercing question because it gets to the very essence of who we are and what we do and why we do it. Paul said, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. What on earth are you living for? 